the problem that we're going to do today is that there is a sphere of radius r that is filled with some volume charge density. It's filled with some volume charge density rho naught. Now, if this example didn't say Gauss's law at the top, how would we know that this is supposed to be a Gauss's law problem, that that's the way that we should solve it? First of all, usually Gauss's law is way easier than other uh, ways of solving the same problem. So you should always choose it if you can. Second, Gauss's law can only really be applied to problems with symmetry. Now this problem has a lot of spherical radial symmetry, <clears throat> so in that sense we're good. But in general, point one here is pretty important. Usually Gauss's law is the easiest way to solve an electrostatic problem if it's available, so you should always check to see if using Gauss's law is an option for you. Because if you can, that's how you should solve the problem. It's easier and it'll just go faster. So how do you solve a Gauss's law problem? One, identify the symmetry. So here we've got a sphere of radius r with a uniform charge density inside, uniform volume charge density. I'm going to name r something else because r is also our spherical radial variable, so I'm going to name it r naught. That makes it easier. There is no angle dependence on anything, and there is no like nothing, no dependence on theta or phi. Um, our answer is going to depend on r. And if we choose an arbitrary observation point here and choose two off-axis points on the sphere, we can make a symmetry argument that shows that any non-radial vector components of the electric field will cancel out, and only the radial components are going to remain Because for any differential charge element, dq, over here that I decide to do a, a Coulomb's law kind of thing with, <clears throat> I can choose another dq prime over here to cancel the non-radial component of the electric field. So any electric field components that are not r-hat directed don't exist. Step two. Well, with that in mind, we have to figure out a Gaussian surface. In this problem, we are asked to find the electric field everywhere, meaning for all values of r, theta, and phi, both inside and outside the sphere. <clears throat> so our Gaussian surface is going to be another sphere with some arbitrary radius, we're going to name that radius r, but that radius is allowed to vary. It could be some value that is less than r0, or it could be some value that is greater than r0. So our Gaussian surface is a sphere of variable radius r. <clears throat> Okay, cool. Now that we know the surface, we can actually evaluate, evaluate Gauss's law, and that is that the charge enclosed by the Gaussian surface is equal to the flux integral of the electric flux density going out of the Gaussian surface. Okay, so this enclosed charge is going to have a different value depending on whether the radius r of our Gaussian surface is less than r0 or greater than r0. So we'll do this two different ways. As you can see that for values of the radius that are greater than r0, it doesn't matter how much more you keep increasing the radius 
of the volume, <clears throat> you still only enclose the total charge in the sphere. For values of R that are less than R0, you, include, you enclose part of the charge in the sphere, but not all of it. So let's write two separate cases. For one of them, for R less than R0, Q enclosed is equal to the integral over theta equals 0 to pi, phi equals 0 to 2 pi, r equals, I'm going to use, yeah, r equals, I'm going to say r prime equals 0 to r. Um, we're going to integrate over primed coordinates because that allows us to use r as our observation <clears throat> point of our constant volume charge density inside the sphere times dv prime, our differential volume element. And for a sphere, dv prime is going to be r prime squared sine theta prime d r prime d theta prime d phi prime. There we go. So when we evaluate that, q enclosed, nothing depends on theta, uh, sorry, nothing depends on phi, so we get a factor of 2 pi for that. Then we have an integral from 0 to pi um, of rho naught r prime, sorry, squared sine theta prime d theta prime d r prime. When we integrate this r prime squared, oops, I forgot the r integral from 0 to r. There we go. When we integrate the r prime squared, we get 2 pi um, r prime cubed over 3, 0 to r, like that. Um, and then we still have to in, uh, evaluate integral from 0 to pi of sine theta prime d theta prime. When we're evaluating this integral, we have uh, minus cosine of theta prime from 0 to pi, which is minus, minus 1, minus 1, which gets us 2, all right? So now we've got 4 pi times r cubed over 3, minus 0 cubed over 3, which is still 0, <clears throat> times our charge density, which I actually forgot to write down in this version. There it is. Um, so the enclosed charge in the sphere for some value of r that's less than the volume of the sphere, so our Gaussian surface is enclosing part of the sphere but not all of it, then it is 4 pi r cubed rho naught over 3. We could go through the same process for values of r that are greater than r naught, but what we can do is realize that if we set r equal to r naught, then we get that q enclosed is equal to 4 pi r naught cubed over 3 times rho naught. And based on the fact that our sphere of charge has radius r naught, there's no extra charge outside. So this is also true for r greater than r naught. The enclosed charge is just the total charge involved in that sphere. All right. So on the left-hand side, we have two different options depending on the value of r. r less than r naught, we got 4 pi r cubed rho naught over 3, and r greater than or equal to r naught, we got 4 pi r naught cubed rho naught over 3. And all that has to be equal to the flux integral um, of the electric flux density. All right, so let's do that. We said <clears throat> that our Gaussian surface is a sphere, which means that ds is r squared, that's r directed, r squared, sine theta d theta d phi. Remember, we've talked in class about how <clears throat> this factor of r squared is there because d theta and d phi are angles not lengths. 
So the R squared needs to be in there because your distance from the origin actually modifies how far the distance d theta or d phi actually is. Um, and we said that our electric field quantities don't depend on angle, only on r. <clears throat> now there is no r variation in this integral. We're only doing d theta and d phi here. So what we get is that this integral becomes integral from 0 to pi, 0 to 2 pi, of some constant value d of r, because r is not varying here, times r squared, sine theta d theta d phi. Cool. From the previous integral, we can remember that the integral of sine theta d theta gives us 2, and the integral from 0 to 2 pi d phi, that gives us 2 pi. So we end up with q enclosed is equal to 4 pi r squared d of r, where this is the amplitude of our electric field vector, or the magnitude of our uh, electric flux density vector d. I sort of impl implicitly evaluated a dot product here because I said earlier that all of our electric field quantities are r-directed, so we've got r hat times its magnitude d of r, and we're going to take the dot product of that with ds, which is also r hat directed, and that gets us d of r times the magnitude of ds, which is what we end up with over there. Okay, so if we want to know the amplitude of d so that we can actually come up with a final expression for the electric flux density and then the electric field, what we got to do is substitute in our enclosed charge. And that has two different values, but let's just divide by 4 pi r squared and put it over there to begin with. So d of r, let's make it a vector because we know how to do that, is equal to two different things in two different regions. It is 4 pi r cubed rho naught over 4 pi r squared times 3. I've just mashed together our enclosed charge expression with this stuff <clears throat> for r less than r naught. Or it is 4 pi r naught cubed rho naught over 4 pi r squared times 3 for r greater than or equal to r naught. And when we simplify that, the 4 pi's cancel. On the upper expression, the r squared cancels with two factors of r in the r cubed, so we just get r times rho naught over 3. Um, and on the bottom, the r naught and the r squared do not cancel because r naught is a constant and r is not, but the 4 pi's cancel and we need our vector directions on both of those, r hat. So, a final clean expression for our electric flux density is r rho naught over 3 r hat for r less than r naught, or r naught cubed rho naught over 3 r squared r hat for r greater than or equal to r naught.